guys, welcome back to another episode of Control All Career. I'm your host, Jennifer Ong, and in this podcast, I interview people who have taken a leap of faith and pursued an alternative career path in Asia. Before I get started with today's episode, I'd just like to let you guys know that I've started a one on one career coaching program. So if you are someone who's tired of feeling unfulfilled and unhappy at your corporate job, and you're looking to take action and find a job that's more fulfilling, a job that you can wake up every morning excited for, then send me a message on Instagram at ongjennifer underscore or via LinkedIn. I love to see how I can help. All right. So today I'm super excited to have John Lim join us. John is the founder of This Humid House, a botanical design studio in Singapore that works with plants and other living media across various industries, from events to landscape design. Some of his clients include Cartier, Dior, Hermes, and even Singapore's Housing Development Board. And his work has been featured in Vogue, Monocle, and many more. So a bit of a background about John. He was born and raised in Singapore and studied architecture at Cooper Union in New York City. He practiced architecture in New York, Tokyo, and Beijing, and actually always thought that he was be an architect. He actually stumbled into landscape and floral design when he took a gap year from his architecture career to take a bit of a mental break. What started off as just a project helping out a friend landscape the warehouse hotel eventually turned into a fully fledged business, this humid house. All right, I'll hand over now to John to tell his story on how he transitioned from architect to founding one of the preeminent botanical design studios in Singapore. Super happy to have you here today with us, John. I guess I'll just start off from the very beginning. I know that you grew up in Singapore. What made you decide to go into architecture and specifically why the U.S.? So my dad went to school in Canada. So he was really supportive of, of the idea of a North American education. And so I think that was always on the cards. I think the harder part was kind of deciding what I wanted to, to go to school for. And I knew I was in a creative field. So with that in mind, this was really a process of elimination. I went to the local library. I, I checked out every book that I was kind of interested in, from fashion to architecture, interior design. And the more I found out and the more research I did, it seemed like a very logical conclusion that I should really just get into architecture. I'm also a big talker. So I think, you know, more traditional career paths, like say being a lawyer or being like, or, or, or like being in business, for example, was definitely like on the cards. But I think my parents understood that they were dealing with someone who was like a little bit more creative and really needed his own space. And so like, they pretty much let me decide what I wanted to do. I really thought that as a designer, architecture was really the largest scale that you could work at. And, and this, I had this instinct that that was the case. And it, I just happened to be completely right. And I think because I've done architecture, it sort of made me kind of fearless as a designer. Like, you know, it teaches design thinking on the largest level. And because of that, it's, it's given me the confidence to, to work on anything, really. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So it wasn't like your parents like pressured you into it. So um, you went to school for architecture and after graduation, were you like, okay, I'm going to be an architect. I guess it's like a relatively straightforward path, right? Sure. It, that was a uh, completely great. safe assumption to make. Yeah. I, I thought I was going to be a lifelong architect and doing this and like following a traditional path of, of being an architect. Before graduating, I was doing internships um, every summer just to get a taste of what that was like. And I chose to do internships with um, architecture firms that were kind of diverse. So I wanted to do something with a small firm and then a medium-sized firm, a larger firm. But also I, I wanted to be exposed to different styles and approaches to running a practice. I did internships in, in New York, I did internships in Tokyo. Um, but around the time of graduation um, was, uh, I graduated 2010, um, I think the, and, and I, this is school in New York. Um, and around the time the Lehman Brothers crashed, that was 2008. I remember receiving news that the previous graduating class was still in big trouble in terms of like finding jobs. And so entering into this kind of depressed job market, it just made sense for me to, to look elsewhere. At the time, there was a lot of exciting work coming out of China. And I just thought, you know what, let's take a gamble here and apply. One thing led to another and I found myself working in Beijing. That must have been quite an exciting time to be working in China, actually. 
like prior to all this. I think it, it, it was almost like the time where Google was exiting. So there was like a lot of flux here and like there was a whole kind of surge of like Chinese nationalism and protectionism. And so witnessing all of that flux and change, um, but also really being exposed to kind of a Chinese optimism um, against a backdrop of sort of like a depressed financial market in the West was super interesting. So you worked there for a couple of years. What made you decide to move on? I, I have to say, I loved everything I did. I love working in China. I love working in Beijing. I was just really overworked, 100 hours a week for three years straight. And it was, yeah. it was mentally, physically exhausting. And I thought, well, it's going to be impossible for me to really unplug. I needed to actually move away for a while. So it was never like, bye, I'm leaving. It's just like, I just need a break. And so I came back to Singapore in 2015. And in my mind, I was just like, look, I've worked enough for five years. I'm going to give myself a little bit of a gap year to figure out what I want to do or where I want to be next. I wanted to ask you more about this gap year. I think for a lot of people taking a gap year, especially in Asia, is something that's kind of a scary concept because people are like, oh, then I'll have a gap in my resume. What will I do? Were these concerns that you had when you were thinking about taking some time off? Yeah, I think there was a slight concern about that, but I didn't feel like super bothered by it because I was coming off a fairly solid resume. And I think anyone in architecture knows if you need a break, you really need a break. <laughs> so I wasn't too concerned about that. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Okay, so it was a pretty straightforward decision for you. Were you thinking like, I'll just take time off like a year or two years or? Mentally, I gave myself like a year, but I'm very creatively driven and I didn't even get a year off. I almost immediately launched myself into something else when I got back here. Uh, I, you know, I had a friend who runs the Lo and Behold Group and they're moving offices. And he's like, hey, would you like to design our new office? And I was like, I need a break. And then after doing some thinking, I was like, no, I'll do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wasn't idle for long. Okay, so you started with this project for the Lo and Behold Group doing interiors. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. I guess like as an architect, it's pretty easy to do interiors as well. It's like part of your toolkit. Well, you're right. Not. Um, it's interesting. I think a lot of architects um, understand interior spaces, but in terms of furnishings and the finer detailing, joinery, carpentry, not all architects are, are familiar or, or experienced with that. But architects pick up on things pretty quickly. And so it wasn't that big of a shift for me. There were some gaps in knowledge that were filled up pretty quickly with just asking around and working with contractors that were experienced to understand how things were put together and, and, and constructed. So that wasn't super difficult. Okay. So I know we talked a lot about background. You studied architecture in school. You know, you worked at an architect firm for a couple of years. You came back, um, did interiors for the Lo and Behold group. How did that all lead into Humid House? Were you doing sure. plant-based like design for the Lo and Behold group back then? So everything happened really quickly. This was in 2015, 2016. Around the time I was doing the interiors, the group was opening up the warehouse hotel. And my friend knew I had an interest in plants. And he said, do you want to try doing landscape design? And I'm not a landscape designer. I mean, I barely knew the names of plants and trees at that point. But I also knew that if I ever got the chance to do that, I really wanted to do things differently. There was a lot of landscape design out there that I wasn't really happy with. I didn't think that there was a real voice coming from the region that had a kind of identity that was unique or interesting. I encountered landscape designers and landscape architects in, in my work before. So I knew what a landscape submission looked like. I had an understanding of what that entailed. So that was very helpful. And I just took the plunge and decided to do it. And it was amazing. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed myself. I think my biggest gripe, I was working in architecture. And this is like revision number like 35. And I was like, no, I, I just really don't have the kind of patience to work on something for so long. And so I think what's a little bit more rewarding with working with plants is that the gestation period isn't so long. Plants grow, trees grow. The landscape never actually stays the same at any point. That's immensely satisfying. I do want to backtrack a little bit. So your friends knew that you were always interested in plants. Was this something that you were always drawn to at a young age? Yeah, for sure. My grandfather was like a really avid gardener. Like we, we grew some vegetables. Um, we always had fruit trees in our garden. So I, I grew up sensitive to, to the idea of growing something. Um, I, you know, it, it, in, in primary school, they have what you call like, uh, I'm a young scientist program. 
where I think there were 22 different disciplines that you could get badges for. Like I'm a young astronomer, I'm a young chemist, I'm a young whatever. And you had to like earn points by doing projects. And I was completely disinterested in, in anything except for the I am a young botanist badge. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I believe like you only needed to like get 20 points to get the badge. But I, 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 I did every project on the list. I got like 40, <laughs> like, you know, it was like, it was, it wasn't even necessary, but I enjoyed myself so much that I, I did that. So for sure, there was definitely an interest in plants. So e- even at an early age, the interest was already there. For that first project that you did for the warehouse hotel, how did you go about figuring out how to do all of this? I, I really wanted the hotel to feel a little bit more glamorous. So I looked at the Beverly Hills Hotel and one of its most iconic spaces has this banana print wallpaper. And I thought, wow, this is a form of branding where the plants are so integral to the design of the hotel. And I thought about the Warehouse Hotel and one of the mood boards said, the Warehouse Hotel secrets, smoke, and spices. And it's interesting because it was a place of a very rough trade. There was like gang activities that happened in that hotel at some point. And in terms of the interiors, it was kind of dark, moody, kind of smoky. At the same time, I discovered this banana plant that had these red spots on them, and it's called the blood banana. Uh, It's Musa Sumatrana. It was a super interesting plant, and I was really obsessed with it. I was like, oh my god, what if this was the signature for the warehouse hotel? Mm. And so that became a very central kind of ingredient in in this landscape. I was also realizing that a lot of the times, in, in a lot of mixed plantings, there's a lot of yellowish greens involved, and in our hot sun looks very bleached out. So for the warehouse hotel, I thought, why don't we try a palette of only very dark greens, and to contrast that, we go with like silvers. So it's almost like black and white, or dark and, and light. And so that was really the main thrust of that, celebrating this blood banana plant, and then going with the landscape with a palette of like extremes, very dark colors and then silvers yeah oh wow when you were designing this was it more like an interior design project with elements of plants in it or was it like okay please like go deck out our place with plants no it was full-scale landscape so like this is landscape that was fronting the front of the hotel and like it was full-scale landscape design um i also did the interior plants as well um but but that but i think the main draw for me was really working on that that plot of land outside that was fronting the hotel yeah and how did you go about sourcing these plants that's a really great question what i did was when we opened up the tender process to contractors i made it very clear that if they couldn't get this plant they wouldn't get the contract and the ones that eventually won the contract i really picked their brains and and asked them how they went about sourcing there was a, a lot of curiosity involved in terms of sourcing i was really intrepid in going to every corner of this country to to look for the things i wanted so i at some point did take over some of the sourcing and procurement so you literally drove around to different nurseries and was like hey can i check out what you've got wow okay cool so that was one project you were probably thinking oh this is a one off project i'm just going to do this for my friend and then move on right Yeah, at that point, I wasn't even sure if that was something that I wanted to do or or had the capacity to do. Around the time, my brother was getting married, and and so were a few other friends. And they were like, hey, John, you like flowers, don't you? I'm like, yeah, I do. And they were like, would you like to work on the flowers for my wedding? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'd like that. And so I was not just going to nurseries to source for this one project. It was sourcing for plants um, and flowers for like other people's weddings. The only reason why I wanted to even do this is because I could see myself doing things differently from what I was seeing other people do out there. If I didn't have a point of view that was different, I think I would not have done this. With floral design, what I was seeing out there, it seemed very English inspired. So a lot of big English blooms like hydrangea, roses, and it was done in this very like rustic English country style. I could understand <laughs> that it was beautiful and weird, like in this hot, sweaty country. This doesn't speak to me at all. And, and at the same time, we have all this gorgeous material to work with, like tropical material. Why aren't we using this? Am I the only person that like thinks this is beautiful? And so it was a little bit of a hunch that like, if I found an exciting way to work with these ingredients, that there might be other people who would be into it. There, there's so many exciting things that you can do with, with all the plant species that survive in our climate. It was totally underexplored. So you kind of overcame your imposter syndrome by having a very strong point of view. You felt like there was something sure. that you could contribute, then that's why you were confident, even though you didn't technically have the traditional mm-hmm. background in landscape design or floral design. How did you go about 
testing this hunch that people would be interested in using more local florals. There's this kind of association of tropical material as being not luxurious. And I think early on talking to some of my friends, I, I certainly got the vibe. So how do you take what people associate as tropical material but use it in a way that made it seem expensive. And it was all about pairing them with ingredients that were unexpected and also understanding what makes something look precious or expensive. So it's not about making it more palatable. It was using tropical material in a way that was not cliched almost. I'm very thankful that very early on, I had some open-minded clients who were just like, yeah, let's go for it. And that was sort of how things started. From there, I think it really was kind of word of mouth. People come to these weddings and, and they're like, oh my goodness, this is really different. Who did this? And this is exactly how the business started. I was doing small weddings for friends and all of a sudden I was doing a mega wedding. At that point, I, di I didn't even have a studio space. I was working out of home. I hadn't even registered a company <laughs> at that point. And then I realized, whoa, this is like a big deal. I had to scale up suddenly. At some point, I just put out multiple ads on Craigslist and Gumtree to look for part-timers who could work on it. I put together like a run sheet, a schedule, a manpower sheet, logistics. It, it was a very steep learning curve for me. And once I was doing larger weddings, I knew immediately that I had to absolutely incorporate a company and, and make this actually a legitimate business. So this was like in 2017. That's when it started. When was that point where you decided, uh, okay, I'm not going to go back to architecture anymore? I'm just taking a little bit of a break from it, but I don't ever see myself as not doing architecture because I'm applying all the design principles and thinking and the strategies and criticality and rigor that I am in my work now just on a different topic. So I, I still, in, in some ways, think of myself as an architectural designer. All of the things I learned in terms of proportion, and scale and understanding light, all of that comes into play when we come up with a concept or a design. Even with landscape too, you know, it's intimately involved with architecture. A lot of times, like, how are we accentuating the scale of this building? What language um, is the architecture in and what is the strategy or concept around that, for example? I think it was at some point where I was requesting for portfolios and resumes. We were hiring designers. And I, I thought to myself, like, oh my God, my resume has not been updated since like eons ago. I don't even know what my portfolio would look like now. And so this moment where I couldn't even see myself going back to a job because I really found something else. And it was kind of a, a realization that I was finding my own path. That's super interesting because it's not like you were giving up this old identity to create like a brand new identity. It's almost like an evolution of your identity. Like sure. I've just incorporated pieces of my architecture background into this new scale or this like new medium that you have here. And I guess in that process, when you were telling your parents like, hey, like I'm just going to do like Hewitt House full time, I'm going to incorporate a company, et cetera. What were their thoughts around that? Were they pretty supportive or were they like, oh, wait, what, what is going on? They've been like the most supportive on this journey. I think they've really been my biggest cheerleaders. They are just enthralled by all the things that, that I've been doing. And they're incredibly happy and proud of, of everything that I'm doing. That's amazing. I think having a good, strong support system is so important and so crucial in this, in this process. Okay, so maybe shifting gears a little bit, kind of walk us through how exactly you go from like an idea into the actual execution so like, for example, like someone's like, oh, like, hey, like, I would love to, you know, like have you like do my wedding, like do the floor, like the flowers for my wedding. How does it go from like a concept into the actual end product? I, I get this question a lot and there's no straight answer because the process and this is what I love about what I do is it can be pretty random. What I tend to do initially is just talk. I talk to the client to get an understanding of what they like, what their expectations are, what kind of people they are, what they want out of a wedding, which is intensely personal. You, you kind of have to figure out the dynamic of, of the client. I think that that's really important to, to us. And then second of all, I would call this almost like the fact-finding period. Where is this wedding going to be? Or what, what events are we talking about? Are we doing this in a client's house? Is this in a hotel? And then you go to the space and a lot of the times it's the space that speaks to us. You want to make a visual impact or like something that's impactful. How do you work with this space? And it's not so obvious. Sometimes, you know, with a space that's super tall, you might actually want to do something super low, for example, to emphasize like the height of the space. So it's not always a, a black and white or like an immediate answer. At the same time too, everyone has a repository of ideas and desires that they want to test out. 
And sometimes when you figure out the client, you look at the space and you have this whole encyclopedia of ideas, it's almost like kismet, like there's like a match. And, and so, you know, if, if there's a really strong instinct here that it might work, then we go ahead and pitch and that's how it turns out. How do you actually like model this out? We make visualizations for our clients. They're mostly like sketches and 3D kind of visualizations, but we also keep them a little bit more ambiguous or vague because with florals and stuff, there's so many factors involved. I could be designing a wedding one year from now. And, you know, you may be specifying something that's not in season. So it's really important to kind of keep it loose because come the time, things may change a lot. So I think it really is giving them an understanding of the overarching theme and concept and, and all these things, but not locking yourself to presenting things in a very specific way. And that's why we don't do very photorealistic renderings because it gives an expectation of a look that we have actually no ability to commit to. How do you work with your team to execute your vision? I have a few core team members who have been with me since the start. And and these are the people that have a 100% understanding of the brand. And they've been actually integral in developing its voice. There is a wildness that comes from the tropics, a kind of heat, almost like a feverishness that we try to convey in our work. You look at the kind of wildness of the nature reserves here and you see things that are overgrown and overtaken. So everyone understands that this is kind of the impetus for starting this botanical design studio. And I like to keep it open. I don't like hearing, oh, this is not your style a lot. It's not a style per se. It's a, it's just a way of thinking. And it's really through exposure with the team that people kind of understand what we're trying to get at because it's not so black and white. A lot of the times I'll have a junior designer ask like, oh, can I do this? Or can I do that? Or like, are there any rules here? And the, the difficulty or the frustration for them is that we actually refuse to like set down rules in stone because things change. So we, we refer that series of guidelines, but there are no like fixed rules. So just broadening out the question to just ask about your team, in the early days, was it just you or you very quickly hired a team? I was putting out ads and stuff and I've been through like dozens of like people, but I have a very quick sense for people who have a different perspective. I think just going through very intense and pressure cooking environments like in architecture firms, you kind of like immediately understand what works who the people that will be supportive, you know? When you throw multiple things at somebody, like how do they react to that kind of information? Are they natural leaders? Do they ask for help? Do they communicate well? So all these things become very apparent when they work with you. And so I've been super lucky in that the people who have been with me from the start are just, have been the most excellent people. They will absolutely be people that you should interview in your podcast too because we have people who are biochemists. <laughs> People who have MBAs, people who really have not seen floristry as a career. But I think this is why we really are a design studio where people are designers. You know, there's an association with floristry that it's a very low paying job. And certainly, yes, but I'm pretty determined. And I think we are on our path to really treating this as a proper kind of design profession. That's super interesting. How big would you say your team is? We have 13 people full time. Okay. And they're all designers. It's interesting, even the people who are not designers, like my finance manager loves flowers too. So everyone helps out. Yeah, I would say almost everyone is a designer. Got it. Okay. So you guys then outsource the actual execution to contractors. For floral design, we don't. We we do everything and we hire freelancers to help us with that. But for landscape design, we have to because we just don't have the machinery and workers for that. So typically with a larger project with landscape design, we have contractors to execute. Got it. We talked a lot about the floral side. Maybe tell us a little bit more about what you're working on on the landscape side. Sure. We work on a a range of projects for landscape from smaller gardens for clients and private homes. And that's really a real joy in trying to create like a mood or a concept and really understanding and responding to what the client wants and responding to the architecture. And then there's a whole shift in scale to, for example, we are in the middle of completing a project with the Housing Development Board where we're designing a master plan for a landscape where in the brief was potentially using plants that have very particular fragrances that help people with dementia Mm. as a kind of a way of like like wayfinding. So it's a a huge shift in scale here. I like that idea of using scent to kind of guide your way. I think that is such an interesting concept. Absolutely. This is not something I came up with. I think this is something that people in urban designers are are realizing have an effect. And and, and it's a conversation that is, is emerging out of that space. So really the whole gamut of projects you've got going on from this events and you know restaurants and brands all the way to, to private homes and even HDBs. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I never actually dreamt that I would fulfill the whole gamut of things. I've had interest in, in all these areas. 
but I'm so privileged and fortunate to be in a position where like I get to work in this whole spectrum of, of projects. And one of the things that I realize really kind of protects the business also in the time of pandemic is that we have such a wide variety of products and services um, that we do that, you know, when once something is hit, there are different mechanisms and revenue streams that kind of protect us from this. What would you attribute your success and all this opportunity to? What do you think you did that kind of led you to all of this? To be honest, I don't really know. I see connections in a lot of things. I see patterns in behavior. I see patterns in design. And I think that's been very helpful in like drawing connections very laterally across different fields. And I think with botanical design, this is exactly what I've applied that that hunch on, that all this is kind of related and it's like it's a natural environment, it's using natural material. And it just so happened that a lot of these businesses kind of like or these revenue streams or, or like products and services kind of like align and have connections with each other. And that's why it's a botanical design studio because we're not florists, we're not landscape designers, you know, like we just work at the largest and the largest, like on all scales, but the, the, the common thread is like, we just, we're just involved with using living media. So it was being able to connect the dots across different industries or different fields <laughs> that kind of led you to go down this path where there's just seemingly door after door of opportunity, <laughs> which I'm sure obviously at that point in time, it's not as straightforward. <laughs> sure. No, there certainly is like an aspect of it that's just like, we're pinching ourselves. Like I couldn't even imagine being asked by the National Gallery, for example, to work in installations for like a gala for uh, a very prominent artist, um, you, you know, like to work in a, a large scale art installation at the Esplanade, for example, to get to collaborate with brands like Chanel. I mean, things like that are just like, oh, we just, you know, there, there is an aspect of what we do that's just basically pinching ourselves. <laughs> Uh, That's honestly uh, amazing. And would you say that all of this is just because you have like such a differentiated view or differentiated voice? And that's what draws all these brands and people and clients to you? I think it's having, obviously, a different point of view, but also listening to the client, actually. And at some point, figuring out what the situation is. Is this a project to push your own point of view? Or do you have to take a step back and putting yourself in, in their shoes and making sure that they understand that you understand what they're about? So it, it, it's kind of a different approach with, with different clients. But I would say that... I, I think a lot of our reputation is number one built on our point of view, but also built on the understanding that we get it. We get that. Mm-hmm. Like being flexible around their views Absolutely. and their brand as well. Absolutely. What do you feel like is next for your business? My energy has been spent like really um, growing the floral side. And I think there's just so much potential on the landscape side to exert a kind of larger influence. A lot of people don't even know that we do landscape design because ideas have been incubating. And I think the past couple of years have been more than enough time for us to really understand who we are, our voice, and what we're trying to do in the area of landscape design. And I think that the next couple of years will be spent fleshing that out further and seeing what opportunities we have in that sphere. I think one of the questions you asked is that, did you have to put up a, a, a large capital investment when you started at Human House? I think some people who listen to this podcast may be people who are aspiring florists. And I have to say, it's very easy to start as a florist because it's a market where it's super low barrier to entry. You can work from home. There are wholesalers that you get material from that's open to the public. And all you need is like a, a social media account. Obviously, because it's a low barrier to entry market, there's a lot of competition out there. You definitely need some kind of a point of view that makes you unique in order to be successful. I would say the difficulty here is scaling up because you can do retail arrangements and, and offer that like whole product line of retail products. But if you have to scale up into events, this is not very realistic in this, in this COVID period, but when you do an event for like a thousand people, for example, it's no longer working out of your home, it's logistics. So the scaling up process is quite difficult, but I have to say that unlike F&B businesses where it's very front heavy and you have to rent and, and, and a space and, and the, out, the outfitting of the space is, is a huge capital investment, it, it wasn't really the case with what we were doing. So that's very relatively realistic and, and palatable to, to people who were starting out. And you know, you can grow your business. I mean, you know, like you, it's, it's the cash upfront business too. People pay for things before. Events and weddings are usually paid before something starts. So it's a model that is actually relatively mm. safer, I would say. Um, I think yeah, and, and on that vein, how did you come up with your pricing? That's a very good question. And to be very honest, we struggled so much because I just couldn't find literature around it. And, you know, it's funny, I really have a heart to over deliver. So I don't think we ever lost money, but I don't think we were very profitable. Our margins were very, very tiny. And this is not realistic. We just need to increase our margins here. It, it's a question of understanding what price tolerance is and then bringing costs down. So 
I think our pricing model has changed, but it has been based on the understanding that we cannot charge the prices that we used to if we actually wanted to make this sustainable. So this is a weird algorithm that we've kind of figured out at this point. But you know, they, there are so many courses online now. There's like a, a program called If I Made, um, which interviews Laura's and they talk about different pricing models, for example, and that is very much available. I wish that I had access to that information when I was starting the business. But it's really nice to know that a lot of the conclusions that we come to by ourselves, other people have come to that same kind of model of pricing too as well. Okay. I also wanted to ask, you know, one of the biggest concerns people have when leaving their corporate job is that lack of salary. Uh, and I think that stops a lot of people from really pursuing something that they're passionate about. Kind of talk us through how you thought through that process when you were leaving behind your corporate job. Sure. I think what was very helpful is that I did move home. <laughs> with my parents and I think that was very helpful in, in creating kind of a secure base and I wasn't worried about you know that I had a roof over my head I, I have to say that I took a, like a ginormous salary cut I, I, I basically was drawing a very minimal salary and I still am now as the business stabilizes a little bit more I do see a future obviously with more stability in post-covid or post-recovery where that would be a dramatic increase but at the same time it is actually a tremendous sacrifice but I'm confident that there will be a sort of a turnaround where that will not be the case. I think for me, the sacrifice makes sense because you're working towards a larger goal. And so I, I have the understanding here that this is a time where you have to be leaner. It's a lot easier for me to stomach as a business owner because I see a future uh, in, in this. And, and I'm enormously proud that this is a business that's able to sustain 13 other people in wonderful ways. It's not so much even the profit. It's like 13 people who are in some ways feeling engaged in their work, who love what we do. And there is kind of an amazing satisfaction that comes with that. Like a fulfillment that you can't ever buy. <laughs> yeah, so linking back to this, one of the questions I do ask all of my guests is, you know, in the Western world, there's this idea that if you follow your passion, eventually the money will come. Whereas in Asia, it's much more around financial security. What are your thoughts around these two things between passion and uh, financial security? Well, it's absolutely a balance. You can have all the passion in the world, but if your ideas are mediocre and you don't have the ability to carry it out, it's not going to happen. I think the passion is, is definitely a critical cornerstone and a gateway to success, for sure. But there's like 30 other factors <laughs> involved. Market forces, quality of ideas, you know, so it's never so simplistic. It really is a balance. Kind of like a Western idealism, almost a gung ho and belief in self and tinged with a kind of Asian pragmatism that I, I think is absolutely critical. And I think it's precisely this position that we're in that we've, you know, been able to see both sides of the coin and pick and choose the best of each that I think makes us like super strong. From the outside looking at it, it seems like you've got a really strong balance between these two halves. So I think something that we can all strive towards as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just a couple last questions for you. Do you feel like you have a mentor in this space? Or did you actively go out to find a mentor when you were starting up your own business? I think it was really scary because I was starting this out without much precedent. I don't think there's a design studio that does what we do and the kind of range of things that we do. There were people that I definitely looked up to, like designers and florists and landscape designers whose, whose work I really admired and, and still do. But they were not in Singapore, so it was very difficult to reach out to them per se. I have to say, like, the one thing that I, I did lack as a creative person was uh, I never attended a business course or an accounting course. So that was very difficult. But my dad's also a business owner. And I think at some point when the anxiety levels were like a little bit crazy, I cannot tell you how beneficial it was for me for, for someone to come in and really just sit down with me and say, hey, listen, this is how you do a problem loss sheet. This is what a balance sheet looks like. This is how you do cash flow. So I think my father particularly has been absolutely uh, integral in just helping me figure out and giving me a sense of security. Got it. Just one last question for you. Any last piece of advice for people who are either aspiring entrepreneurs, more specifically aspiring florists, or people thinking about going into this botanical space? Anything that you would want to share with them or anything that you wish you knew before you embarked on this journey? I think it's interesting that a lot of questions I get from people who are starting out, it's like, am I doing it correctly? Or is this right? Those, those are questions that it's almost like fear-based or constraint focus, you know? And I, I think that in this evolving world, you absolutely need to be nimble and flexible and just sensitive to what's around you. Fundamentally, I think being super open-minded is, is key. 
and being as lateral as you can, like drawing connections out, being sensitive to what's out there, being sensitive to opportunity, and not having a lot of preconceived notions of what your path might look like. And I think that's what it is, right? Like our careers nowadays is not just one straightforward path. It's not like you're just defined by this one term. It's actually very fluid. And there's a lot of change that can happen, especially with technology and everything. It's not like you can expect yourself to be doing the exact same thing 20 years down the road. So I think that was a nice way of summarizing all of that. And with that, we'll draw this to a close. Thank you so much, John, for talking to us today here on the podcast. Really, really great to hear your story and uh, to see all the successes that you've had with Human House. And uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much. And there you have it, my conversation with John. Here's a couple key takeaways that I got from this conversation. One, having a strong creative point of view and a clear idea of how his product was different from competitors was what helped John overcome imposter syndrome. Despite not having experience in the landscape and floral design, John had a strong belief that he could do things differently in this industry by using local florals in a unique way, and that other people would be interested in it. His distinct style also led to a very strong marketing plan for his business and helped him grow his business mostly through word of mouth. Two, speaking of word of mouth, connections really do matter. This can be seen from how John's first project started off from just connections through family and friends. But by jumping on these opportunities and getting his work out there, he was able to get even more projects through word of mouth. Three, While it is important to have a strong creative voice and a strong brand, when working with clients, it is also crucial to understand the clients and their goals and learn how to balance your voice with theirs. Four, leaving a stable career to start your own business can be a tremendous sacrifice, but it is made easier if you have a larger goal that you are working towards. For example, building a business that can support 13 employees and the fulfillment that you can get from that broader, bigger goal. And lastly, in this ever-changing world, it is important to be flexible and open-minded and sensitive to opportunities and changes. Our careers nowadays are not just one straight path, so don't let preconceived notions of what our path may look like stop us from pivoting and growing in our careers. For example, John never actually expected to create a botanical design studio, but because he stayed nimble and flexible and never boxed himself in as just an architect, he was able to grow in ways he never expected. And that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Control Alt Career. Check back in two weeks for our next episode, where I'll be interviewing Jada Poon, who left her job as a corporate lawyer to become one of the most sought-after photographers in Hong Kong. And if you liked this episode, do hit subscribe and share with two friends who maybe aren't so happy with their corporate job and need a little extra inspiration. As a reminder, I do have a one-on-one career coaching program. So if you are feeling not too happy about your corporate job and looking for some guidance, feel free to reach out to me and follow me on Instagram at ongjennifer underscore for more information. All right. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys back here in two weeks.